Hi everyone, welcome to our session on copyright. Today we're going to be talking about a very important reform process that's happening in the EU right now on copyright. Um, it's been over a decade and finally the European Commission has come forward with a proposal to update and modernize copyright law that was passed in an era when we still used VHS and CDs and that predates the smartphone. So there's a really big need to update copyright law. Um, but copyright law is often very sort of obscure. And I think for most people it's hard to put your finger on why exactly it is so important. Why is copyright so important for free expression? Why is it so important for creativity, for innovation, for the open internet? And I think it's also uh, that the EU is also quite obscure. Uh, the EU processes in the Parliament, in the European Commission, in the Council, they're sometimes very closed, very complex, and very hard to navigate. So most of us here, the three of us here, are based in Brussels, and Jake makes so many trips to Brussels that he basically counts. Um, so today we're going to bring the Brussels bubble to you. Um, and before I, we start, before I introduce my panelists and do a short introduction, I just want to do a quick audience poll. Who in this audience has ever uploaded content on a platform online? Anyone? Oh, lots of people. Who here has ever streamed music or a video online? Ah, oh, interesting. Who has ever posted a fan fiction or a comment or anything on any platform? A comment. Yeah. <laughs> Who has ever uploaded code? into GitHub or anything. Ha, ah, wonderful. Okay, so lots of hands. So all of these issues that I mentioned, plus more, um, are what will be impacted in this copyright reform. So copyright impacts all of us. It has a really big impact on the shape of the web and on the health of the web. Um, so I so today, basically, we're going to talk about this copyright reform that was, it's a copyright directive. Um, what we are concerned about is that it, is, it lacks ambition, so the copyright reform proposed by the European Commission doesn't really bring copyright into the 21st century. It doesn't modernize it in the way that we want. But what's worse is that there are some dangerous proposals in there to extend copyright. And what we'll be focusing on today is one article, Article 13, which um, we'll, we'll dive into more, but would create uh, censorship machines and mandate mass uh, filtering on platforms in the name of copyright. So today we're going to learn about what exactly is in Article 13, what does it mean, why is it so dangerous for free expression, for fundamental rights, for creativity, and whether or not it is actually good for artists, for the creators. And finally, we'll talk about what you can do and how you can help stop these censorship machines. So we are joined by a fantastic panel of copyright experts. We have uh, Caroline Decock, who is the coordinator of Copyright for Creativity, Diego Naranjo, who is Senior Policy Advisor at European Digital Rights, or EDRI, and we have Jake Beaumont Nesbitt, who is of the IMMF, the International Music Managers Forum. So we're going to start with, we'll do one quick round, and then I would like to open it up to you guys. So you can think about your questions or your comments, and I'd like this to be uh, an interactive discussion. So we'll start with Caroline, who uh, will tell us a little bit more in detail about the copyright reform and what Article 13 means. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Caroline de Kock. I am from C4C, our copyright for creativity. We uh, are launching during Republica also a news information portal called Copy Buzz, uh, B U Z Z at the end, dot com, uh, which you can hear more about at 1 p.m. at Lightning Talk 1 uh, from uh, one of our leading journalists, Glyn Moody. Um, and we are following closely the big mess called the Copyright Review in Brussels. So, Article 13 is not about copyright. That's false advertising that the Commission did on us. They said, ooh, 
were changing copyright and then they put an article that is basically about censoring the internet. Um, I want you all, when you come out of this room, to only remember one German expression and that is Eins, drei, Polizei. That's all that 13 is about. It's about policing the internet and it's not about the police being your normal police, the friendly gentleman with a mustache and a uniform, but it's about big American companies acting as censorship machines under the threat of law and uh, in cooperation with rights holders, an ideal scenario for the internet. So what's on the table under Eins, drei, Polizei? Under the, on the table, it's um, a system whereby if you are a platform that accepts large amounts, whatever that means, of user uploaded content, any content, you will have to talk to right holders when they tap on your door. So right holders are in some cases a small creator that did something funky, in most cases Sony, you know, Time Warner, um, big Hollywood studios, the recording labels, big publishing uh, companies, Axel Springer in Germany. Um, those type of people will come to you as a platform, say, hello, you get a lot of user uploaded content that could be, obviously, if you're YouTube, a lot of music, a lot of videos, but that could be GitHub with a lot of code, or that could be uh, Wikipedia with a lot of knowledge being uploaded. Um, well, we think that some of that content could be illegal. Please, this is our catalog of copyright protected works. Make sure you filter before it's uploaded and prevent the availability of that content. So basically, Article 13 is about your capacity in the future to upload something on the internet and not see it blocked randomly because of some private agreement between a platform and a rights holder. No police, no tribunal, nothing in terms of public authorities needs to intervene. It's all in, under the terms and conditions of the platforms and it's all approved by law as being a great idea. That's what Article 13 is about. Um, our biggest problem in Brussels is that we're not surprised that the French like that, because the French usually like anything that protects copyright, but we're very surprised that a lot of German politicians like it, because we thought that Germany had a tradition of respecting privacy and freedom of speech of its citizens, or at least that some politicians had that, uh, or felt obliged to pretend they had that tradition. Uh, yet, uh, Article 13 is currently being supported by a lot of um, German politicians. I hope that it is because they don't understand what it means. Um, I've also told friends that if it gets adopted, um, I think I will go to the factory here in Berlin, the place where all startups are, and create a new startup, which would be a trolling company. Any one of you can just send me any material that you consider is copyrighted, drawings of your kids, some bad singing you did under the shower, send it to me, and I will go to all platforms and notify to them that that is the catalog, and they need to filter it. Obviously, it's absurd because there is no filter that exists that can identify all works. And you can't identify music sheets. You can't identify architecture. You can't identify lots of things at the moment. And I don't think you want that filter to exist. But, you know, I'll notify them. They'll tell me it's impossible or too expensive. And I'll settle for a certain sum, which I will share uh, you know, with all the, the people that send me their content afterwards. It's bad for user. One last word for the startups. What Article 13 does is basically recognize existing filters like Content ID of YouTube. YouTube has that type of filter on their platform. But what it also does, it, make it it's, makes it impossible for European startups to compete with existing platforms 
Because under this system, you have to allocate part of your budget when you start to paying for such a filter. And that means part of your budget is not going to paying for an engineer or a great coder or you know, someone that will be an innovator, but just to buy for some very, very bad censorship software that is likely to uh, block more than it should because that's what you do when you are liable. You know, in doubt, you block. So I think that's 13 in a nutshell, and uh, you will say more about the impact on users afterwards. Yes, thank you very much, Caroline, for that very clear and, and concise explanation. I think one of the problems we have with Article 13 is that it's very confusing when you read it. Um, so a lot of um, politicians, policymakers in the EU are now trying to figure out how to fix it, what to do, um, and they're having a lot of trouble wrapping their head around, I think, what it actually means. Um, and so Caroline explained really clearly that it, it's making these open platforms liable for content, making them uh, a, m broker agreements, maybe in the form of licenses with major rights holders, and implementing potentially very expensive tailored filtering technology. Um, and this impacts um, our videos, our home videos, and user-generated content, what is sometimes referred to as UGC. So that's actually one question I didn't ask. Has anyone here ever remixed music in this, in this audience? Yes? Anyone, anyone ever uh, made a meme or a GIF? Anyone ever shared a meme online? Some. <laughs> so this is impacting uh, how these open platforms work, which is far beyond licensed content like um, uh, licensed music, right? It is user-generated content that is also copyrighted because we are all rights holders. Um, so now I want to go to Diego, who I think will, will tell us a little bit more about what are the consequences of having something like Article 13 um, adopted if all platforms hosting large amounts of copyrighted content have to implement filters. What will that mean online? Uh, well, bad news, I, I guess, in, in any case. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk uh, about copyright either. Uh, um, uh, what uh, Noam Chomsky calls uh, temporary monopolies for corporate tyranny, so we call intellectual property rights, uh, because this is something uh, totally different. This is a, a general trend to choke the internet. And this is done in two different ways. One is uh, through voluntary agreements, so they push companies to enter in these agreements to maybe uh, filter hate speech content in Facebook, for example. And the other way is that this is being done uh, in the corporate uh, directive, which is coercion by uh, for uh, platforms and, and intermediaries. And as uh, Caroline said, this, uh, the problem with this is that uh, uh, platforms and companies, in, if they are afraid of being sued or afraid of getting fines, they tend to overreact. Um, the current uh, uh, situation in the EU is that the legislation allows for uh, a proper balance of interests for companies. Uh, it, uh, it allows for them to have an incentive to take action against illegal content, but on the other hand, they don't have too much incentive to restrict freedom of communication, and that can be over if this goes uh, ahead. The, the, the European Commission, when they uh, defend this uh, proposal, they say, well, it's not that intrusive, it's not a general monitoring obligation, which is something which is uh, uh, banned in the European Union. They say it's not a general monitoring obligation because they are looking for specific things. So uh, when you enter here in Republica, for example, you have a backpack or a handbag, and they look for every single bag, uh, looking for weapons or, or alcohol or whatever, whatever they look for. Uh, it's not a general monitoring obligation because they're looking for, for things, something specific. This is, of course, absurd. And the general trend is uh, well, that we are moving towards uh, privatized law enforcement. And we see this in hate speech legislation. We see this in anti-terrorism legislation. We see this in child porn uh, prevention. So the general trend is, as Caroline said, to make the, the companies, the police, and the judge of the internet. So we, you can forget about their police. We can forget about our own courts. And we leave Facebook and Google to deal with all of our problems. Um, regarding um, fundamental rights and liberties, uh, Snowden, Edward Snowden said in a recent event on press freedom uh, about uh, content filters that he said that it's very dangerous practice for free societies to embrace them. Um, because the thing is that once filters are put here for 
copyright purposes. Of course, the current government or the next governments we can come up after the ones we have in our countries, uh, well, they can use it for whatever they want. They can just alter the, that and where they are filtering everything. So let's use it for censoring uh, speech. Um, I will finish uh, with, a, I think, a, a quote from, from Orwell, and, but trying to rephrase it as the commission would say. In Orwell in 1984, this is a famous uh, quotation, war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. But the commission is trying to put in our minds that what they say is something else. So it would be like filters are innovation, freedom to communicate is piracy, and censorship is digital single market. Thank you, Diego, for that double speak. Um, you bring up a really good point about the incentive um, article would create about making, li making platforms liable for copyrighted content, which is almost every content. They would have an incentive to take down content, right? So this has a massive impact on expression and creativity and also the ability of platforms to exist rather than having only the biggest platforms that can afford the best filtering technology and have a team of lawyers to be able to manage rights clearance um, and take on the legal risk of having open platforms where copyrighted content can be uploaded. So um, lots of dangers there. I want to turn now to Jake because if we're going to censor the web in the name of copyright for rights holders, um, will this be good for artists? Will this help them? So I'm from the International Music Managers Forum. We're a trade association that looks into the business interests of the artists. We're artists and their representatives. Um, the point that Diego just made about the doublespeak and the Orwellian contortions of the language on this, it's quite difficult for me coming from the music industry to sit on a panel that's about the censorship machines and stop this because that's one description, the description that Caroline gave of Article 13. And then the other one that we have inside the music industry that's the one that generally the artists are exposed to from music industry intermediaries, so the labels and the publishers, is that this is for us. This is the commission trying to help us after our business was disrupted by digital, Article 13 is a way of supporting creativity. And the way that it would support creators is it supports the people, the companies that sustain creators. So in other words, this is a, Article 13 is written on behalf of the record companies and the publishers, because if you want to help artists, you help record companies and publishers. And so it's very difficult for us internally in the music industry to look at Article 13 and say what, what are the unintended consequences, what's the logical outcome of this for the artist business without taking a narrow view as to how does this work for a music publisher or a record company. Um, and the longer we look at it, the more we do start to use language like filters and censorship and stuff like that. And it's because we don't sit as the artists on one side of the fence and the users on the other. The artist is connected to the users. The artist, their fan base is their business. It's their audience that sustains them. And trying to find new business models, ways to make money that where you're giving value and you're sharing the music and the emotional connection with the audience is what we're all about. We don't need to do that necessarily in an old way as prescribed, as set out by the old industry that was disrupted by digital we can potentially come up with new ways to do it. The biggest hurdle we have at developing new business models is investment. It's very expensive for artists to devote the time to creating music full time, to go out on the road, to uh, spend time in the studio. Most of them will have to work a full time job and then do this as a hobby while they develop. So you end up with the artist being grouped in with the so-called user-generated content. So stuff that fans are uploading, hobbyists, people who don't consider themselves as artists, is being uploaded, say, to platforms like SoundCloud or YouTube in the same way that startup artists are uploading. Elvis, when he made his first recording, he went into a local studio in Nashville to make a, a disc for his mum's birthday. He had no intention of becoming a global superstar, he was creating what we would now describe as user-generated content. Now he'd probably have done it through Facebook. He'd have shared a video with his mum. 
Um, so that area of where the artists do their R&D, where they develop their audience, where they build, we, we have a foot in that area, the artists, which is the bit that's being controlled, locked down, restricted by Article 13, and that's where we're developing. So if we get that area restricted, we are forced into areas controlled by the traditional stakeholders, which broadly in the music industry is Universal, Sony, and Warners, and regardless of their ownership across France, across Japan, they're run from America. So you get a very American-centric set of three, maybe at most 10, if you're taking some of the bigger independent companies, three sets of rights holders who become very powerful. At the point where you have an obligation on platforms to filter, to check content, to make sure the rights holders are happy, the risk to any platform, as Caroline explained, of uploading stuff that they're not happy with becomes too great. It becomes too expensive to create an environment like a YouTube or a SoundCloud where artists can develop and flourish and build independently their own business. And you force all of the music, all of the content into narrow platforms that then lean very heavily on licenses from the big players. So you end up with a slightly sort of monoculture in the same way as we're seeing all the high streets in Berlin would look the same as the high streets in London or Brussels with the same stores, you start to get that on a platform like Spotify where they have a global playlist which is dominated by the artists pushed by these three big companies out of New York and Los Angeles. So we really then worry about plurality and diversity for the ability for European artists particularly to get onto the internet to reach audiences and develop their own business model. The thing that we're after, artists and their representatives, is funding. If you force us into an ecosystem that's controlled by three big companies that can take their pick of what's successful and are based in, in the States, it's really unlikely that their control over the marketplace and therefore the ability to fund artists because you wouldn't invest in an artist if you didn't have access to the market, so only those companies that control the market will invest really puts restrictions on us developing new business models. So from the starting point of hearing that Article 13 is for us, for artists, then hearing from our partners who we do like working with, there's lots of great things about record companies, music publishers, collective management organizations, but hearing from them that we really need to support this thing, it becomes very difficult to then sit on the other side of the discussion and sides of it but the longer we've had to discuss these these proposals came out in September last year the bigger the the momentum and the consensus is amongst our community that we really have to oppose this and it becomes difficult to stand up and say we don't think that is in our interests when half of the uh, members of the European Parliament and all of the music industry is telling us this is for you you must get behind it so we're, we're breaking ranks on this having had a long discussion and saying we actually think this is really dangerous in terms of um, the artist. So if from the user's perspective it's not good, the fans, music fans, and all, all forms of, of uh, culture and content, and from the artist's perspective it's not a good thing, you then have to really worry about what the momentum and the incentive is behind this. Thank you, Jake. You raised so many um, important points that we come across in our uh, advocacy for copyright, or if any of you have, have come across it as well, is that there is a difference of what, there is a more nuanced uh, view of what a rights holder is, what artists and creators are. And if you look at only half of the story that, yes, you might hurt startups with Article 13, yes, uh, there might be censorship, okay, there might not be a lot of user-generated content on these platforms, but the creative uh, industry, the creators in Europe will thrive. And when you talk to Jake and IMMF and talk to individual independent artists and music managers, you see that actually for artists, that plurality of platforms and open platforms is sometimes what they really need in order to build those relationships with their, with their fans. Um, so it's not actually for the artists. Um, so uh, I would like to open it now, I think, for questions to the audience. If you guys have any questions or comments, we'd love to uh, involve you in this discussion. 
or people are not caffeinated enough? <laughs> and Caroline wants to ask a question after. Okay, we have, have one and two. Good morning, I'm Conrad, Conrad Ritter. Um, I'm not a specialist in your area, but I was interested because it seems here is sort of a debate going on about protecting rights and opening rights, so that's why I thought it was interesting. And um, I got the impression that you did a very good advocacy piece, but somehow I feel not satisfied that I heard loud enough um, who would, um, who does actually benefit from copyright or where the nuance is. You have it right now as an either or, and my gut feeling is that cannot be the answer. So I think it would be very helpful if you are more clearly showing both sides and where the path is through and not just the devil. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, maybe I can do a quick disclaimer and it's maybe not so clear. When we might, we, we might not be in favor on this panel of uh, Article 13 of these filters, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are against copyright. <laughs> What we are looking for is a balance between the protection of copyright and the public interest. Um, the biggest problem with Article 13, and then I'll leave it to you guys if you want to take this, the biggest problem with Article 13 is that it's way out of balance. That it's like killing a mosquito with a machine gun. Um, and so we, we support, at Mozilla we certainly support finding ways that for artists to get fair remuneration, um, figuring out how they can be paid better and treated better and protect copyright. We consider ourselves rights holders too. We have exclusive rights as well. But we also think that a lot of these uh, problems can be solved by uh, having more openness, having more open platforms, different business models, seeing what can emerge from the, from the market. So we're, we're not advocating to abolish copyright and I'm really glad you bring that up because I think a lot of uh, members of the European Parliament and in the EU feel that, that that might be their, they would get painted into that corner if they say, I don't really support Article 13, then they'll say, ah, you're against copyright, you're against rights holders, you're against the, the creativity in Europe. Um, and so, thank you. So I just wanted to make that disclaimer, but um, do you guys want to take that? Do you have something to respond to? Yeah. I, I, I think Article 13, um, the inception of Article 13 and the big mistake at the start when we started looking at it is that it was clearly aimed at one single company when the discussion started, and that was YouTube. So we started by calling it the YouTube article, um, and it was clearly stated by various rights holders like IFP, who represents the music industry, well, part of the music industry, that their big beef against YouTube is that there's a lot of music on there and they're not getting the same amounts of money out of YouTube and the sharing, you know, deals they have there as they would out of a Spotify. So basically it's like in the old days when people were complaining about radio helping people to listen to music and then they wouldn't buy, you know, CDs type of beef. Um, I don't have an issue with them being annoyed at YouTube and picking a fight with them and all of that. The problem is, is that that complaint to the Commission resulted in Article 13 being drafted as an open-ended provision that applies to any content, so not just music or audiovisual content, but anything, a protected work, and to any platform with no relation between what's on that platform and the content that you could be complaining about. So it's kind of, I'm going to GitHub and asking them to impose a censorship filter for audiovisual, even though I know there's no audiovisual on GitHub type of. So it's um, the principle of companies being annoyed at each other because they're not getting fair deals and that being solved through legislation that then has a lot of collateral damage, that's what's wrong with Article 13. Um, I think if um, Sony or uh, EMI are not getting a fair deal out of YouTube, and I'm willing to believe them when they say that, they should go to their antitrust you know, authority and say, well, they're being abusive. 
Maybe the problem is with the music industry that then antitrust might look at how they treat their creators and discover they have the same practices that YouTube has with the recording industry, I don't know. But I think that is the basic flow of Article 13 and of a lot of the copyright directive is when a legislator thinks of a specific problem, you know, between two companies or with one technology and then tries to write an article that is general. It, it always fails because the guys you're aiming at, they're big enough to survive and you know, do their thing, uh, but it's all the small ones that get caught in the net that usually are the ones that have the misery afterwards. I don't know if that helped you at all to see who were the, 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 the stakeholders in this. I'll just jump in on that as well. We, we come at it from the artist's perspective, so we support copyright and we want to get paid, so we support licensing. So we're in favor of anything that ensures there's more value, more money coming back to copyright through licensing, direct licensing or collective licensing. That's why it's so difficult for us to come into this and then think, oh, that's the wrong route. Um, the technology that exists that a lot of this is based on is not good enough to allow the broad sweep of artists who aren't inside the formal so-called music industry, the independent artists that are increasingly flourishing. So it would start to create a really narrow definition, a tight definition of the music industry, and that's why it inserts control within a few historically powerful players. Although things like the internet, Napster, Steve Jobs and iPods uh, go back a long time, the streaming thing, the new business model is 10 years old. Spotify and YouTube are 10 years old, and it's really only in the last five years that consumers and artists have, have really embraced them and understood that this is the future. This is we're, we're at the start of the new industry that's emerging from the old one. A lot of the complaining from my industry about the effect of digital is that we look at our old business model, we say we used to sell CDs in which you would pay, say, me 10 euros for the right to listen forever to that album, let's say it was 10 tracks. The new business model is you might pay a micro payment through ad funding or subscription to me per use, and I might never get that 10 euros off you, but I might get more in the long run life of copyright. So we're really struggling to adjust between micro payments for rent of music versus um, larger payments for ownership and we're basing a lot of our complaints on we used to make this much now we make that much and it's completely illogical and without foundation so that's a really bad basis for making far-reaching copyright rules just as we're it's it's about 10 years but really it's like five years into the new business model what we need to do is to see new platforms emerge and provide solutions for artists. We get really excited when we look across at television where increasingly disintermediation is occurring, the production houses are being forced out, uh, platforms like Amazon and HBO are going straight to the creators and investing in them and saying give us content. So if there's less money on the table, disintermediation, remove the record labels and the publishers is a great way to get more money to the artists. On the price of streaming, we think currently the pricing model is too high. Spotify comes in at round about 10 euros globally, $10 stateside. As Amazon and Apple start to compete for audience share in that, they will be able to, particularly someone like Amazon, will bundle the music subscription in with other offers, with Prime, with deliveries, with things like that. So Spotify is going to have to start to drop its per month price to increase its audience. So we can't sit there and say, streaming's great, it's growing. We think it's overpriced and that to grow the user base and maybe the total collections, with the price of it will have to come down. This, these are really difficult questions for us to tackle. So coming up with a th an Article 13 that just gives control back to some of the rights holders is one thing, but none of 13 addresses the problems of how we grow revenues, how we address the different business model and that side of it. And it's very hard to come up with positive solutions that do address those.
Thank you, Jake. We have a question. Um, two questions, if I may be cheeky. Um, the first one is, uh, since we have the Brussels bubble represented in the room, um, how are the politics of this playing out? Obviously, the copyright um, directive was proposed by, uh, you know, under Ertinger, who has since moved to other things. I mean, uh, is the commission as enthusiastically behind it as it was when it proposed it, um, from, from your understanding? Um, and secondly, are you planning protests? Are you planning uh, kind of blackouts, et cetera, et cetera? What can we expect to see? Okay, we'll take a few. Yeah, there was also you and right, this woman here. Maybe we can take a few. And then... Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, do you have any kind of idea how to solve this problem? I mean, the, it's not only the EU, but also member states like Germany trying to push liability towards intermediaries and, and other service <coughs> providers. And it's not only pushing the liability, but require them to act as if they were part of the judiciary. So it's, that is something really strange going on, which seems to me as if serving some kind of a US way of thinking that first amendment only, only uh, relies on governmental kind of relation. And there is this business, so we don't deal with it. Uh, but, but somehow it just seems to me that we are all, or most of us, are really critical with this kind of solution. EU comes up and also US comes up, but I just don't know whether you have anything in mind, how to solve it, how to reconsider e-commerce directive maybe, which is already 17 years old, so there are, there are these legal measurements which, are, which were designed for a totally different environment. And my question is whether you have anything in mind how to go forward and push forward. Thank you. And Paul, you also had your hand up, but... Okay, so maybe we can have each of you go through these three questions. Yes, regarding the, the forces behind it, uh, well, we were meeting people from the commission before the proposal was out, and then even the most hardcore uh, copyright fundamentalists uh, in the Commission did not agree with most of the things that were being discussed. Uh, so uh, it seems that uh, Ottinger was the main force behind it, even uh, above uh, copyright fundamentalists uh, in the Commission. And the, we, we, in order to see which are the real forces, I, I have an anecdote of uh, one of our meetings I had with uh, some uh, permanent representation of one big member state in Brussels. I, w I was explaining all these uh, issues uh, about the Article 13 and also ancillary copyright. And say, yes, all of these are really dangerous things. Yes, yes, okay, yeah, I see the problem, yeah, yeah. But you know, publishers are so influential. Uh, this is someone working for a democratic country telling me that, well, uh, we are not in power. You, so the people of that country are not in power. It's some big forces, some small, some a small number of big companies who are deciding the policies, which I find uh, quite worrying. Regarding protests, well, Edri is not the uh, go on the street uh, protest style, but uh, our members could be. But uh, we are, we think that this is probably leading to some ACTA-esque uh, a moment well, when, when this is going to happen or this needs to happen or we will not stop it. Uh, regarding the e-commerce, uh, it seems that it's, a, it's an older legislation, but it has been uh, able to allow a lot of uh, uh, innovation and in the internet grow uh, so far. If there's a need to discuss it, uh, we can discuss everything, but uh, I don't think killing the protections of the safe harbor in the e-commerce direct is going to fix this problem. Um, there's a couple of tools online you can already use to reach out to the European Parliament. Uh, there's Save the Meme uh, that is, uh, has a tool to call your, par your uh, MEP or to call an MEP. And there's Save the Link that is a campaign that initially focused uh, only on ancillary copyright, so press publishers' right, but is now also expanding to Article 13 because as we are all discovering, that's actually the biggest bomb in the copyright directive, much more than the press publishers' right to, to a certain extent. Um, on solutions, uh, I think over 20, I think it's 24 members of the European Parliament sent a letter um, today or yesterday to the European Commission asking for clarification on notice and action by private companies. So basically, the system that the e-commerce directive has implemented is one whereby if you see 
illegal content of any form, because of copyright or hate speech or whatever, you notify the platform. Once the platform is notified, it needs to take action, and that action could be to remove the content or to contact the person that uploaded it to ask, do you have a legitimate right to put this? I mean, the problem is that notice and action is referred to in the e-commerce directive, but it doesn't say what should happen. So it's pretty much up to every platform to invent their procedure. And in a lot of cases, it's not easy for users to understand what happens. The content gets removed. It looks like a painful process to you know, um, contradict the claim. And you just think, OK, my content's removed. So I think, to go back to your point about how do we try to avoid all of these platforms getting a blank check to do whatever with our content, um, clarifying the notice and action procedures and making sure the rule of law applies to them seems like a good way uh, to start this. And that hooks onto the e-commerce directive, but doesn't open it. Because believe me, it's 17 years old, but it's a really well-written document. It's five pages long. Brussels has not produced legislation that is five pages long for ages. What we produce now is 50 pages long, and it says white, black, and gray in the same document. And then we give it to a judge and say, good luck. And we're amazed that the legislation, uh, the, the court decisions that come out of it are all over the place at national level. It, it's very confusing what we do now, because there's so many. In those days, there was no lobbying in Brussels, or not as much. <laughs> so legislation was still reasonably good. Um, I think those were. Um, and actually, going back to your question about campaigns, I would like to ask the people, and you don't have to answer from the room, you can come to me afterwards, what would work? What can we do to make people act against that? Because um, in the days of ACTA, we had 10,000 people in the streets of Warsaw by minus 10 protesting, protect, uh, protesting against ACTA. The problem is, in these days, with what Poland is experiencing in terms of its government, I think they have other reasons to go in the streets than copyright, so it's going to be difficult. Um, also, in the old days, things, um, and going back to your question about, you know, Oettinger is, is gone, do we throw a party in terms of the Commission changing their mind? No, because it's in the hands of the Council and the Parliament now, and the Commission is just intervening as a honest broker with some form of influence, but kind not that much. Um, so we, we are dealing with a council, so member states. These people get only influenced in capitals. They don't get influenced in Brussels. And then we're dealing with members of the European Parliament that also normally only read, listen to their constituents, so people in their member states. Yet we haven't found the magic solution to make people in the member states massively, people do it, but massively say, no, I will not accept you to give away my freedoms, my fundamental freedoms, away to private companies and to give them your blessing when they're censor, uh, censoring me. We haven't found the way. So if you have ideas, um, you know, come, I'll give you my card at the end. Feel free to send them to me because we, we're, we're, yeah. We, we don't know how to trigger dismay. Uh, the dismay we feel we haven't found a way to share it to, the, to you know, John Smith in the street, because as soon as they hear a copyright, everyone goes blank and thinks, oh my god, complicated. So. We have a problem in Brussels in that the other stakeholders within the music industry, the intermediaries, are very powerfully established. They have large offices with large staff. We have no one there. Um, the, there is explaining to the politicians that the industry doesn't necessarily speak for the artists is a slow process, but hidden within other articles, so we've been discussing 13, in 14, 15, and 16 are acknowledgements that record companies and publishers haven't treated artists fairly over money. We don't think that the value of the adjustments, there's small adjustments into how artists can check what they've been paid or the rates that they get paid at. We don't think that 14, 15, 16 in and of themselves transform the artist business model, but they're an acknowledgement that the policymakers need to treat the rights holders, the intermediary rights holders and the core rights holders, the artists, as separate interest groups. Trying to find a positive way forward we would like to scale up the impact of 14, 15, 16. There is a proposal from a Polish MEP, Rosa Tun, 
that would give artists access to usage data that would help them to understand their audiences. So digital platforms create a lot of information about the usage and consumption of music. That information gets lost at the intermediaries, the record labels and publishers, doesn't make its way back to the artist. Only the artist can really leverage it because only the artist is operating across recordings, publishing, brands, live, and having a direct social engagement with their fan base. So we would like to get it in the mind of the policy makers that the artists have a very clear different set of rights by asking for more value that's already in the system. This doesn't impinge on the uh, consumer's rights. They're already giving this information across the platforms like YouTube and Spotify. We would like that information to reach all the way back to the artist and that it's not, we think, is evidence that the, uh, the proposals aren't necessarily based on artists. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to plus, plus one Caroline's uh, open request that uh, we would love to hear from you, uh, particularly the German audience, because the, the, the Germans have a lot of influence on this file in particular and in Brussels. Uh, and if we can move something in the member state, then it actually trickles up uh, to, to Brussels. So anything in terms of how to make, uh, how to get that act of movement how to make copyright, uh, and the EU process, I think, more tangible. And many of us have you know, ongoing campaigns, and C4C has been releasing all sorts of little short videos, which are very helpful. Um, and Mozilla just launched yesterday um, a, a paper storm campaign where you can drop uh, papers on your, your representative in the parliament and, and in member states. So we're, we're all looking for ways uh, to, to connect users that, that want better copyright laws uh, to the European process, but um, it's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle, I think. So does anyone, would anyone like to respond to, to that question, or are there any other questions, or should I continue? Okay, all right, so um, we talked a little bit about the solutions in a way, and what, you know, what kind of campaigns we're doing, but is there maybe moving a little bit outside of Article 13, although you're not limited to, what, what would the ideal copyright law be? Like, what, sh what would be the answer to Article 13, do you think? Oh, easy question for me, thank you. <laughs> it doesn't have to go in order, it's a remix. Well, uh, we have written extensively about our vision on copyright, and we would like, uh, to have a copy which is modernized with the 21st century, we'd like to see harmonized uh, exceptions and limitations so we all share the, the same rights across the European Union. We see, we'd like to see a way to remunerate authors which doesn't go necessarily through the, the system we have now, through the current uh, status quo. Uh, so, and generally, we'd like to see a copyright which is not based on enforcement. If, uh, if people don't respect copyright, Maybe it is because it's not working well, because it's not adapted to the current uses. So instead of uh, trying to smash people or smash companies now uh, with the with current hammer of the copyright law, maybe we need to find a system which is respected by everyone. Uh, and that uh, also gives a remuneration for authors, of course. And then we will need less of a hammer and r more than, than distributing the money to the authors. Um, the, the current system, so the, the 2001 InfoSoc Directive, as it's called, is based on um, one harmonized exclusive right, which is copyright. They got that part right in terms of harmonization. And then a list of, depending on how you read them or count them with the sub-bullets, 20 to 22 exceptions that are voluntary on member states. Uh, under the Chinese menu principle, uh, that's not a legal uh, wording, but basically is you can pick and choose from any of those exceptions or parts of exceptions as a member state in your uh, legislation, which seems, um, I think it's an Icelandic professor that computed that that gives more than two million possibilities in terms of implementation. And that is what we are facing at a time where people are uploading content online in one country and it can be seen in the entire world. Um, 
how should copyright then be improved? Well, obviously by taking away that mess and that patchwork where if you ask any individual user, do you think you're doing anything illegal under copyright, they will at best answer, I don't know, or at worst answer, I don't care. Um, both elements are bad for copyright and for creators because we should care about copyright if copyright were to be what it should be, which is a reward for creativity. But because copyright has stopped being a reward for creativity and creators and has started being a way of cashing in for certain industries, we stopped caring. And to me, any copyright review that is valid would be one where we started caring again and started feeling that connection with creators again and thinking, yeah, I'm fine with this rule because, you know, that guy is playing decent music and I think he should get a buck. Um, that's, that's the bit that got flawed some time ago uh, and, and that's the bit that this review is absolutely not addressing. Caroline's described it being the copyright system being very confusing from the user end, not knowing which permissions you have to secure, who you should pay. It's exactly the same from the artist's perspective. Most artists do not understand how if they wrote the song and they performed it, where they wrote it, dependent on what usage is occurring, different bodies will be in charge of issuing a license. So when the artist says, hey, I need to get paid for that, they've got to try and track down the bodies that might have issued the license for those specific uses. That then varies per country, 28 member states in the EU, but then globally. So from our end, it's really confusing. Then on the performer side with the record label, that's an additional set of rights. So we think it needs reforming and really stripping down and becoming much simpler to use. And that would then increase the money that stays in the system and prevent the loss to legal bills, risk, and would encourage more participants to come in. So we would like to really refresh, um, a reboot, a reset on copyright. Thanks. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about, well, so the solutions and the broad strokes of the fact that there is a regulation or a directive happening right now and that it's very important to mobilize in the member states but um, could Caroline could you give us a little more of a uh, understanding of the status of this proposal and what does the timeline look like what would be the best time to act okay that's a difficult one and you know because there's moving parts so at the moment the um, directive is being discussed in parallel in the European Parliament on the one hand and in the Council on the other um, and the way it's being discussed in the European Parliament is that um, they work in committees that have certain specialties. Um, copyright falls uh, under one lead committee, uh, which uh, is the legal one, the legal committee. And then uh, a lot of other committees need to give opinions, so they don't have the same status as the lead committee, but they still have an input to give. Um, in that puzzle of uh, lots of committees suggesting lots of amendments to the text proposed by the Commission. We are at a stage where pretty much um, all the committees have had a starting opinion from a rapporteur, so from someone saying, I think we should change it this way, and they've all had the opportunity to suggest the members of the committee to suggest their amendments on top of that, saying, well, you know, I think it should be changed this way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this will then lead to votes in those committees and usually there is a sequence where first the non-leading committees vote and then it ends up with the last vote of the committees being the one of the leading committee that kind of brings together all of the views of the other guys and tries to find something that looks like a compromise. The initial plan in terms of timing was for all of that, you know, kitchen and magic cooking to happen before what we call summer break, which is pretty much mid-July. Um, as always in Brussels, there are delays because things are more complicated than what things. Uh, and now it seems more and more likely that all of this might be pushed until after summer break, somewhere in September. In the old days of Brussels, like a couple of years ago, 
What then happened is that after that lead committee vote, the text would then be sent to the European Parliament plenary. So instead of having it dealt with by 40-ish MEPs or 60 MEPs in a committee, it would go to the full 750 MEPs. And that was usually that moment between committee vote and plenary vote was when campaigns started, where we would say, write to your MEP, because there's like 700 guys that didn't follow this thing, and you should tell them it's bad or good or whatever. Um, those were the good old days. In the new Brussels, um, they've invented a black box that they put in between. Because everything takes too much time to adopt and you do not want legislators to think too much about legislation when they write it, that's very bad it seems, they try to rush things uh, through. And the way they try to rush things through is by saying, you know what, after that committee vote, in order to make sure we have a good understanding between the council and the parliament, we are not going to go from the committee vote to the plenary vote directly. We are going to put something in the middle that has an English name which is not an English word, word and which is called a trialogue. So we are going to put in a private room with no oversight by anything democratic representatives of the council, representatives of the European Parliament, and I'm talking handful of people, I'm not talking all of them, and representatives of the Commission, and between the three of them, by making sure they talk for a very long time until two o'clock in the morning and do not get access to the food until they have the deal and the booze, they will strike a deal, an informal deal, and then once we have that deal, we will bring it to the plenary vote and we will tell the 750 guys in the room you guys are here to rubber stamp this deal because there's a lot of sweat, blood and tears that went into it in that private room in the back and we kind of, it's done, don't change it. Um, that also means that in terms of campaigning for us, we need to go to you and say, there's a committee vote, it's really exciting, 40 guys in Brussels are gonna vote about something. You need to put a lot of pressure on them and more importantly, you need to stop them from putting the thing in the black box. You need to ask them to send it to plenary and be looked at in a democratic way by 750 guys, not just by a handful of people in a room. Thank you, Caroline. Now you guys are all EU legislative experts and you understand how complicated it is. Yeah. <sighs> so we know that from now until fall will be really important to reach out to your representative and make sure that once that text gets into that secret, shadowy process of the trialogue, then both sides actually have a decent text uh, to work with. I think we're at time, yeah? Okay, so I want to thank uh, the panelists for being great and showing up. And I also want to thank, I, I want to, I want to thank um, Wikimedia as well, who organized this panel uh, together with, with us at Mozilla. So thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of Republica. Thank you.